Uh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, a warning. This talk was mostly intended for people who are uh, planning on uh, contributing to for our infrastructure and gives a very high overview of what, how we're running things. So if you're not interested in that, I would suggest you to go to one of the other interesting talks. Just a warning. Stop downplaying your own fault. I'm just warning. Hmm. Uh, well, if you have service in data center, why not? Okay. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, what do we do? There's sometimes a lot of confusion, confusion about what we do and what we do not do. What we do is we host a lot of services uh, like the Flora websites, um, the, the wiki, the mailing lists, the tools you use to actually build and contribute to Fedora, like uh, Koji, the package maintainership uh, stuff. We also use this, a lot of services internally. Um, Fed message, for example, uh, of which the author is sitting right there. There, Rolf, um, which we use for uh, managing internal stuff and uh, kicking stuff up. Um, we use a Fedora, we run a Fedora infrastructure cloud uh, for a lot of testing stuff and um, other inter other stuff to help the community. Um, we run some uh, some web services which are not Fedora specific. Some of you might know them, uh, Pegier or Fedora Hosted, uh, which we run for the rest of the Fedora community. But most importantly, we do not run your own home machines. You will be surprised how often we get people in Fedora admin asking, <laughs> hey, help me with Fedora server. We ha I've just installed it. We are not there to help you for that. Oh, actually, the Pegier author also just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just want him to tell me how to pronounce it. Oh, yeah. Bagheera? Bagheera? Okay. Yeah. I was calling Bagheera. Bagheera. It's, it's, yeah, a lot of people. Okay. Okay. He's French and he thought it up. <laughs> also, if you have any questions during the talk, just let me know. Because as I said, I'll be at a pretty high level. If you have more in-depth in questions, just let me know. So um, the places we host stuff, we have two data centers uh, hosted by Red Hat in Phoenix and in Raleigh, where most of the stuff is located. Raleigh is mostly a download and backup site for us. So when you download Fedora from the master mirrors, you might end up there. Um, Pretty much all of our services further are hosted in Phoenix. And we have a bunch of uh, donated machines, as I said to you, um, hosted by companies which just have provided us with one or two machines where we host uh, part of the infrastructure used to get stuff close to you. One suggestion. Ask this, can we try to also grab slides? Sorry? Screen. Say again. The this laptop tries also to get the slide probably and you cover half of it. So he's suggesting you yeah. stand right there when you're talking. Yeah, ah, right. Okay. Uh, I will have to walk here. Except when you change the slide. Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, is that live stream? Uh, no, it's using cheese, so I don't think so. And apparently when I stand here, it can't even see my face. <laughs> Let's try to see if that works in any way. Yeah. Just Does this actually work? It does work actually. Oh, cool. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah, who figured that this would actually work? Um, so we have a lot of data centers all around the world where we host most of the, um, sorry? Where we host most of the reverse proxies um, to which I will come in a bit. We also have, um, so most of these machines are just normal machines that are hosting our stuff. We also have in Phoenix a infrastructure cloud which is based on OpenStack. We have actually two of them. We set up one, I don't know how many years ago, in two or three years ago with OpenStack. Very long ago, Folsom, whenever we ask for support, we always get it told like, nah, don't use it, Everyone given, everyone's given up on it. Um, but we actually set up a new instance a, f a few months ago uh, with Red Hat OpenStack platform now. So actually we're now running a supported release, which might match, which would actually help us. Um, this setup uh, is used for, as I said, a lot of internal testing uh, and development instances by developers. Uh, we're also hosting instances for BuildBot um, and we're hosting Jenkins instances here and Copper runs on this, which is a very interesting combination to which I'll come in a bit because it has given us a lot of pain. <laughs> Copper is very nice for, for the users. For maintainers, it's a bit annoying at times. Sorry? It depends a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, which is exactly caused by what causes us the pain. Uh, it's still precise, it also will fail builds randomly and then it'll build successfully if you resubmit it. Right. It's the same exact source RPM with no modifications. Right, but most of the time it works. <laughs> it's Unless not very you're building kernels or something like that. It's not very repeatable and it has some bugs, but most of the time it works, all the time. <laughs> Could I just suggest that you make that the team motto right now? Sorry? Most, most of the time, time it works. Your infrastructure folks, most of the time. <laughs> 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 That's a very good one, I, maybe. Well, Paul, how about it? Define the most. <laughs> Sorry? I'm all about metrics. I see. <laughs> More than 40% of the time? Easy. <laughs> okay. Zero nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Five A's sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, this is what we're hosting, but this doesn't uh, come automatically. As I said, oh, this misses some parts. Let's try it, let's try it anyway. Um, our main data center is in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we have 22 uh, virtual hosts there. We have the master emitters for uh, download.virtualproject.org are located there. Actually, no, that's DL. Download is forwarded to Midors. Um, we also have the build hosts here for Koji um, and a lot of other related stuff used by the infrastructure team. The other um, side we have as a main data center is Rally, where we host the backups off site and we have the uh, other download Midors there. And that's where we had internet two emitters, which we actually shut down a few months ago because we weren't getting enough bandwidth. Hmm. Sorry? It's kind of backwards. Yeah, but the link we had was not very high quality. Um, so we also have some remote data centers uh, where we get donated machines from other companies. We use them as hyper, uh, the servers as hypervisors on which we run proxies, reverse proxies, 
um, we host middle lists and we host DNS servers so that they, they all are local to when you want them because our DNS actually has a split horizon based on your approximate region where you're coming from so that when you're uh, from Europe you're most likely to get a European uh, proxy sent to you. Also, at some service, uh, at some data centers where we actually got more servers, uh, OSUSL and dedicated solutions are two that come to mind. We run other services like Fedora People, Fedora Hosted, and, so, and some that we cannot run in Phoenix too, like Torrent servers, because Red Hat will not allow us to. Oh. They, they will not allow us to open those ports. Makes sense, but so these are all hosted in remote data centers on machines donated by other companies, for which we are very thankful. <laughs> are you saying? Anicia? Ah. Right. Yeah, in fact, you're, I think, also, that's all at OSUA was all saying. Um, so in our, uh, the services we're running, for example, the websites, our websites are actually not, huh? Oh, websites maintainer, Robert Mayer. <laughs> um, if you have, if you want to help build the websites, ask him, he can help you point in the right direction. Uh, they're not dynamic, they're actually built statically every 30 or something minutes. Hourly. Hourly, I just heard. Um, and then synced out from the build server to all of our reverse proxies so that the proxies themselves can answer the main websites so that they do, uh, traffic for that doesn't have to go all the way back to the main data center in Phoenix. Um, this also helps because, as I said before, you often get a mirror or a proxy that's close to your location, which means that your actual, when you request the website, it will come from pretty near you in, instead of all the way across the Atlantic sometimes. Although we don't have any uh, data centers in the Asian region, if you know any, please let us know. Um, so another service we run in all of our data centers is the Metalink services. That's used by YUM to actually get your closest mirror so that uh, the Metalink actually gets a list or determines your approximate position based on IP address, finds the correct or finds the closest up to date mirrors. Uh, in its database and sends you the list of that, including the correct uh, checksums for the YUM data files. Um, the crawling happens centrally in Phoenix too, but then every hour or something, we, we create a new uh, centralized or a database file which we sync out to all of the remote sites. Um, so that you can actually get that faster and it's more distributed over the world. Okay, so one of the most interesting parts of our setup is how we use or how we host our web applications. And I've been thinking very hard of how to illustrate this, but let's try it. So our web applications uh, are actually hosted in Phoenix 2 in our main data center, but they are being served to you through our reverse proxies, which are in the satellite data centers or Phoenix 2. So when you, uh, these colors are very hard to see, I think. Um, as soon as you request one of our web applications, it will actually, um, your computer will send a request to the proxy server, which will then terminate the TLS connection. So that's where your uh, TLS connection ends. 
And after that, it all goes through a private VPN uh, we run. But internally, the traffic is, all, is HTTP, so that the, end pro the back end servers don't actually need to uh, spend time on processing HTTPS requests. Um, also, all of the proxies run a local load balancer daemon so that every uh, request you send gets sent to either one of the uh, uh, application servers for the application you requested. So we have two servers for, for example, Nuancier. Is that how you pronounce it? Sorry? Okay. You should, you need to tell me how to pronounce it sometime. Uh, but so we have two servers for Nuancier. We have two servers for package database. Um, they are all individual virtual machines. An advantage of using that is that we can update one of them while the service itself stays up because the load balancers will all hit the other proxy that has not gone offline. Um, the only part that in here that is tricky is our database instances because we have just a single database backend. So if there's a big schema update, the service might still need to go down. But otherwise, package updates should be, should be able to happen without any users noticing it. Um, all of the proxies, so all of the proxies are actually running a local varnish cache as well, so that uh, static files for applications or wiki pages are actually cached at the proxy so that they don't need to be shipped all around the world if they don't change that often. We don't cache uh, dynamic pages when you're logged in. So for example, package database um, and Runche, when you're logged in, it's no longer being cached. But if you're logged out, since your page will look the same for everyone else, it will get cached on the proxy. You do not have caches on the application servers, only on the proxies. So after it passes through, var uh, through the local cache, it will pass through HA proxy, which is the load balancing service we use. And after that, it will get sent back on to the backend in Phoenix 2, maybe all across the world, uh, from Europe to the US and back, and then back to you. So are there any Sorry, which part? There's, suppose they hit the proxy in Europe. Where is the, where in that diagram there is the transatlantic network? Right, proxy? so your request comes in at the proxy, H Apache in Europe. Uh, the proxy runs Varnish, the proxy runs AJ proxy, and this line is uh, transatlantic. Okay. So the line from the AJ proxy to the backend server in this case, the green line, which might not be very visible. Ah, okay. So the line is not the scale. Sorry? The line is not the scale. No. That well, be 3, miles long. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it might even be, I don't know how long, but yeah. Um, any other questions about our reverse proxying setup? Because this is what is quite difficult for a lot of people because it also makes developing the applications more difficult um, because they actually need to support load balance setups. Like you can't store anything in a local disk uh, without using some sort of synchronization for which we often use cluster if needed. And otherwise we try to stay to put everything in a database. Is there a documentation that you can prove it and says we have to use this if you want to set our static files? 
Yes. Why don't you go and try and ask me all the time? Uh, no, we have a... Um, so, you mean what you will need to do to get something in our infrastructure, right? Not to get it. Firstly, code it so it will be compatible. So right. I don't think we have any documentation for that. But as long as you don't use the local file system, you should be pretty much fine. Basically, no, no file uploads inside the application. Right, Ex and if you do need that, which for example, AskBot, uh, ask.forprojects.org does, uh, we have the two nodes share a cluster instance that uh, synchronizes the file systems. Okay. So that, that kind of Sorry? OpenShift Online. Um, right. Whether there's the option to use that for hosting Fedora stuff, or is that not currently supported or no longer? Um, so we use. So we use OpenShift Online for uh, just status of through project.org, since that needs to be stored outside of our infrastructure. <laughs> I mean, otherwise we can't tell you what's wrong. Um, but the rest is all inside of our infrastructure and hosted by us. If there are some things that run on OpenShift that we just kind of draw a line and say, well, that's, they're not infrastructure problems. Yeah. Any other questions? Pierre, I thought you had something. Or? Um, so one of our services that are used across the board for every other application is our identity service, which um, is, as I said, is used by every one of our applications. Um, it uses authentication against your uh, account system. Uh, the applications themselves use OpenID to connect to the identity server. If you want to hear more, I would suggest you to visit Rob Crittenden's talk tomorrow in this room, because this time he's the one talking about OpenID and federated identity. But basically, it's a central server where everyone logs into. You will probably have seen it. It's the login uh, screen for pretty much every web application we have at this point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although for Wiki and uh, Bodhi, those are coming up. You can't even look at the code anymore, right? Uh, you can, but you will need to do some things locally to get it to accept insecure things, which I would suggest you not to do, so I will not tell you how to do it. <laughs> Has anybody talked to the Red Hat Mozilla people about allowing open ID logins to their Mozilla so we can stop having separate accounts? Yes, we have a ticket open on that. Um, and I don't even know if Bugzilla supports it, honestly. Well, it does. Okay. Bugzilla has a plugin for it. Um, it had been unresponded to for, I think, over a year. and. If I recall correctly, one or two months ago, we got a, it, an update saying we are now looking into adding it to the, uh, the, the process. So okay. who knows? Yeah. I, who knows what's going to happen? If you want to, I can send you the ticket number. Um, uh, but I can, sorry, I can search for it unless it's private. Yeah, I think it's public. Okay. We're, we're trying to be less opaque about Okay. <laughs> oh, you're one of the maintainers? Uh, I'm not one of the maintainers, I work with the open source guys. Oh, okay. Ah, I so, see. Because it's written for all <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all I know is that they suddenly responded, we're now looking at it, into it. Okay. Okay, we'll see what goes on and what happens. So, unfortunately, I don't have a clear answer to that yet. That's fine. I mean, at least somebody asked. Yeah. 
Yeah, which is a feature that um, we are already, well, it's related to some other features we're already working on. Well, maybe you should ask him outside of this talk because he's the fast maintainer. And there's been a lot of talk about having free IPA as fast. I think the current plan is that we're, uh, since fast three is so far along, we're going to move to fast three. And after that, look if we can migrate to free IPA, because that's going to take a long time to actually uh, move because it will not be compatible with any of the interface we have at this moment. Yeah, and we heard that it got pretty much ready now. And we can, it's demonstrable within the <coughs> Right, but we still will have to modify every other, no, no, every I other app yes. applications. So what, what is the right time to have these conversations? Because we need to understand, on the free IPA side, is there anything else that we need to do to make these migrations smoother? Right, I think that we should just pick, come together with your and our team and see what we can do here. I mean, we have multiple days here at Flock. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> okay. So one of our other services that probably a lot of people know about is Copper. Um, <coughs> we, it's uh, two parts, or actually three, but I'm glossing over the third. Uh, the key gen part. Uh, we have a front end which is the part that you actually see and where you're actually seeing the 50, bu uh, 50 waiting builds that are crashed. Um, we have the back end that actually should pick them up and doesn't and which makes you see those 50 missing builds. Um, all of the build, so what the back end basically does is it retrieves the current list of two build items it submit it. It picks the first one of them. It spins up an instance in OpenStack, which tries to build it and should report back. Um, so, most of the time this works, but at some times we get issues where the copper builders are not getting cleaned up, and that's what you see when you are seeing fifty or sometimes to 100 waiting builds. Um, so, and one of the reasons we spin up so many is every single build gets a new virtual machine, which has the advantage that it is very uh, separate, so one build does not uh, impact any of the other builds, it does have the disadvantage that we spin up so many instances that we tend to hit OpenStack bugs that a lot of people would not hit, probably. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry? At least we are testing it. That's yeah. true. <laughs> is there anybody, is there anything that anybody can do to help with that? Um, so just building packages in copper. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, no, no, some but of us have access, but I don't want really to well, no, so... Is there an SOP for, you know, resetting that, or...? Yeah, for that you need to be an inf a, uh, uh, OpenStack admin, okay, so right. you won't be able to do that, unfortunately, but the issue is also, it's caused by Copper not shutting down its builders completely. So if you just talk to them and try to fix <laughs> them, <laughs> their issues, you, you would make me very happy, because I spend approximately one or two hours a week on this. Um, 
So, that's quite a lot of services. How do we manage this? Because we're obviously not logging into every service to set up everything manually and that would not scale at all. Um, we use Ansible for that. The, pub the repository for that is publicly available. Um, link is there, but is also easily findable by just entering in your favorite search engine, Google, uh, yeah, Fedora Ansible. Um, Ansible actually creates the entire virtual machines. So the only part that we manually install are physical machines, which is kickstarted. After that, Ansible kicks up installation of any virtual machines we define, which makes it very easy to set up a new server. Was actually running on the physical servers in RHEL 6? At RHEL 7, most of them now. Uh, some are still stuck at RHEL 6 because they have very interesting edge cases. Like we have but one... You cannot touch it because you will break it if you touch it? Uh, no, that's not really the case, but we have like we have some servers where we would need to migrate VMs off, update it, and move them back, where we only have one server in the data center. Okay. Um, another instance is we have one data center where the server has a very weird bug in the video driver, so the RHEL 7 grub doesn't really work. I have a screenshot if you want to see that. It's very funny. Um, have you ever seen the movie Star Wars? Oh, no, Basically, no, nobody here has ever seen <laughs> <laughs> So the title screen, which yeah, looks yeah. like that, that's how it works. That's how it looks there. That's great. Yeah, it it's very readable. Money for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we also do a reg regularly, uh, we run a master playbook, which executes all of our playbooks in Ansible. Uh, with check diff so that every thing that is defined in Ansible, which is not currently in production, will get reported um, because people do not always run all of the playbooks they modify, which makes for very funny bugs when we actually do run them and their configuration was not correct. It happened more than once, unfortunately. Um, so, we obviously shouldn't try and, uh, to debug in production. We do, we should not. Um, so that's why we have a staging instance and a production instance. This is also where I was coming for you. Um, if you have a service that you would like us to run, we have a documentation request for resources um, that will actually define that you need to first put it into staging with the Ansible playbooks, and then after it gets approved, we can put it to production. The staging and production instances are completely separate. They are not able to talk to each other. Um, so has a different FAST account system? Yes. Uh, there's a diff the FAST account, the, the FAST system is set up entirely itself. Every service we run is set up staging and production. So I remember FAST has snapshots that are taken. Yeah, so sometimes we sync from production to staging because people edit their password in production. And yeah. Um, so the permission system is used, is modified. Um, managed by Fedora, Fedora Account System Group Membership. Uh, MV Apprentice, if you want to start uh, contributing to Fedora infrastructure, just let us know, we'll add you to this group. This will let you SSH into a lot of our boxes and look around. It will not let you do anything uh, write access related. For that, you will need to get into sysadmin and later, um, if we, if we think you are uh, helping a lot in a specific area, we might add you to other groups. But please don't ask for them. We will tell you when, it's, uh, when you should join them. 
So, uh, how to get started with help? Uh, sorry, that's the wrong one. How you can get into contact with us if there's anything wrong with uh, the services that we provide? Well, either come by us on Fedora Admin, on Freenode, um, send, a send an email to the mailing list, or file a ticket if it's something that takes longer uh, so we can actually track what's going on. What's actually the difference between Fedora Admin and Fedora Apps? Um, apps is more meant for people asking about the web applications and um, the people developing it uh, com contact yeah. each other there. The admin is more like for you as an end user to ask for help. Okay. Huh. Not that kind of end user. Yeah, not yeah. that kind of end user, <laughs> user of our web applications. And Fedora NOC? Fedora NOC is for the infrastructure people to com uh, communicate in case of and, uh, problems and other uh, network or systems operations related uh, things. So, uh, how you can help us, because we are always happy to take on any, any extra apprentices that will be able to help us, because we're just a team of, of just a few people. We can hardly do it, everything on ourselves. Um, this is a page where you can find information on getting started with contributing to your infra infrastructure. Um, this is a page which might, which is not actually only for infrastructure, but if you're looking for things to do, uh, please take a look there. It might not have everything. It will often have some tasks to get you started. Just ask us in Fedora Admin, or ask any of us in Fedora or in Flock. A lot of them are currently in the door, so just take a look at who is there and ask one of them, or me. <laughs> 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 so, are there any questions left? Again, me. <laughs> I, I see 4 o'clock in the schedule state of the well-known third-party repository. It's about RPM confusion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're... How hard it would be to take all your Ansible playbooks and just go and replicate it somewhere where you can use RPM stuff. If it's usable for others easily, or uh, well, because the infrastructure of that repository is very bad, I think we will know about it in that talk. But if we can reuse what Fedora already has, or not. right, uh, you can certainly reuse it. But in their case, they already have a setup with a lot of things, which is which are specific to them. If they want to pick up our Ansible uh, playbook. They're more than welcome to, but they are with even less people to manage it. So I mean, I mean, how hard is this? Do I just require some uh, virtual servers and then hit the magic button and Fedora infrastructure starts from the playbooks, or I won't? Most of it, yes. Most of it, okay. A lot of the uh, services just hit the button and you will get pretty much everything we have. There is a private repo where you have to guess what's actually there. Right, well, you don't. Yeah, so that's the only part that's a bit tricky. We have a private repository with where the keys are stored because we don't want those to become public. Um, but Ansible will tell you in itself, like, hey, I need this file and I cannot find it. And often the name is pretty self explanatory. So you should be able to find what it is that you need to put in there. And if you can't figure it out, as I said, just ask one of us. We'll be glad to help you. Because we're always glad to have other people use our Ansible playbooks and everything else. Any other questions? I don't think so.